We started unknowingly. We didn't know what to expect when we got a car and drove to Natick. Natick is a beautiful town with, like many towns around it, lots of history. Both good and bad, both in plain sight and hidden deep in its grounds. There are memorials everywhere for the fallen soldiers and American bravery, and they're all displayed for everyone to see. Natick would even be considered a liberal town. There's little to an outside viewer that would make towns like Natick out to have a dark past, a secret. These Christianized Native American settlements became towns that lived alongside the Europeans in Massachusetts. In 1663, John Eliot created the first Christian Bible, translated into the dialect of the Massachusetts. So this is entirely in a dialect that I don't think survived. It's a Massachusetts Algonquin dialect, but not the same. There were many such Algonquin yeah. dialects. The term he used for the Holy Spirit, he used the Algonquin term for wind, and that was the word Wabin. And that happened to be the name of this guy who was not exactly a chief, but he was a rising leader of a group, the group of Indians um, in what is now Newton, who ended up being the first group to move out here. And oh. the story goes that he was, it helped to persuade him when he heard his own name, that this might be a route to power for him to follow Eliot and yeah. become Christian. That's this is it, this is actually the second edition. It was published in 1685. We acquired this, um, well, there was a sort of a complicated process. A man named Alexander Thayer, who was a law student in 1846, found the book for sale in a Boston auction house and really wanted it for Natick because he had come from South Natick and Eliot was very famous here. But the cost would have been $37.50, which is way too much money for him. So for three years, he tried to raise the money. Finally, he and some um, friends in Natick held a sale of some kind, and they managed to raise the $37.50, which was about $1,200 in the 1840s. Wow. But he was a poor law student, he didn't have it. So they bought the book, and it was held by the town until 1909, when the town voted to transfer it to the Natick Historical Society, because it's really South Natick that is the site of all of this. And mm -hmm. so we've had it ever since. Yeah. When this building was built in 1880, they did dig up human remains. Yeah. Um, now that could have been anything, but probably they were Indian yeah. remains. And they were actually on display. We had skulls on display in the early 1900s. Um, by, the, by later in the century, they were no longer on display, but we had them in our collection until the, 18, until the 1990s. Um, I don't know if you've heard of NAGPRA, it's an acronym, but and I always forget what it stands for. It's the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, I think. And I think it was 1990, but don't quote me. But it, it requires anybody who has either human remains or funerary remains or sacred objects to let tribes know about that and to offer to return them. And so we did, and we no longer have any human remains here. If there were artifacts found here, I'm not aware of them. And they would have been given back because they yeah. would have been grave objects. Yeah. We have a few Indian artifacts. Unfortunately, we don't know how old most of them are. Yeah. Um, we have some very old, you know, many thousands of years that for, from the woodland period and so forth. But yeah. we have baskets and things that are likely from the 17 and 1800s, not from the period when this was a praying Indian town. Mm -hmm. But we need to do more research to find out how old they actually are. Okay. If you go right past the front of the church, you'll see um, the, other stone. the stone for Takawambait. He was um, John Eliot's kind of, well, he was his successor. Yes, yeah. He was the first ordained Puritan minister who was Native American. Mm -hmm. And yeah. after Eliot died, he became the minister here. And actually, you can see, um, this was Takawampet's desk, his pulpit desk that he would preach from behind. Yeah. The top of it actually lifts off, and it's a traveling desk, so he would put his papers inside and carry it if he went elsewhere. And it's an interesting piece because it's such a hybrid. It's, in some ways, it resembles you know, this yeah. Chippendale desk with this traditional European features, but then it has these sort of freeform decorative elements on the side here. Somebody just sort of gave it this texture and the feet, which are kind of shaped like hooves. 
Um, and this was made by Indians here in Natick. My understanding is that they're not genetically related to the Natick praying Indians of the 17th century. In fact, many of them will come in their traditional dress and they'll be, you know, Cherokee or I don't know what, but Plains Indian, not necessarily New England Indians. Mm -hmm. So, but for them, it's, it's the heritage of being Indian yeah. and Christian. And so they identify with the Natick Indians right. through that. They are carrying on in the Christian Right? The yeah, hybrid that's of the Christian and American and that. Mm -hmm. And that's a dual identity yeah. that was sort of unique in those days to the 13 yeah. praying Indian villages, and Natick was the first of those, so. Years later, King Philip's war erupted. Between the Native Americans, tired of Europeans claiming their land and killing their people, and the Europeans themselves. A hunt ensued, in which Europeans became afraid of and hostile toward the Native Americans, even those living in Christianized communities like the Nipmuc tribes. In 1675, the General Court ordered all the praying Indians be transported to Deer Island in the Boston Harbor. Chained and sent on barges out to Deer Island and other smaller islands in the harbor, over a thousand praying Indians did not fight the colonists sending them away. Almost all of them died of starvation, disease, or exposure to the elements in the year they were kept on the island. A first-hand account says John Elliot himself tried to row out to Deer Island and give the Native American supplies, but his boat was capsized by colonists, angry with him for trying. Going to Deer Island is a stark contrast with the quaint town of Natick. Its monuments and local library kept quiet about what happened to the people who lived there before. Going to Deer Island, however, was a completely different story. The place where a thousand souls rest at Deer Island is a power plant. We plot that right from the beginning. We took the soil out. It was supposed to take soil out of there, but let all. It was supposed to let us know that when they were buried, we could check for them. But bones, because they're buried, so it's Arriving there, we were silenced by the rolling hills and smells of the ocean, people walking their dogs in the sunshine. An eerie lack of wind was at the top of the highest hill on Deer Island, and it was quiet. It felt wrong to be there in the first place, knowing what happened. Then we looked at the sign explaining what Deer Island is and what it was used for. It emphasized the colorful history regarding Native Americans on the island. We searched the island for a memorial, a plaque, something. Tours too, they go to all the islands. And the tours never mention the concentration camps, Indian, Indians at all, and monks or otherwise. You know, they, they just don't want it. anybody to know. They're trying to hide the fact that Deer Island was a concentration camp. The uh, director was talking to person that was representing us in San Francisco. On the way back, uh, he asked her what, what they talked about. What, what he was telling her is that they were going to put a monument up, uh, some kind of monument. And none of us knew about it. We should have had some kind of say what's going to be on the monument. You know, it's not that I didn't want a monument. I love a monument. I want, I want to say what we want, not what the government wants. Groups such as the Mu Ekanek Intertribal Committee and the Mu Hekanao National Confederacy Bureau of Political Affairs have been working since the 90s to get not only this tragedy recognized where it happened, but also to inform the people of both Boston and the surrounding towns this secret in their own histories. Tribes on the East Coast was the first to encounter that, the land taken and the massacres and the attempted genocide. This is where it started, and it was just a wave from the East to West. Yeah, I think it's very important to uh, at least at the uh, junior high to 12th grade uh, to teach the real American history. You got, you got to teach it. Teach all of it, not just what you want.